I figured if I could not come to to Italy, I I would wear my Totti jersey. So, <laughs> can you turn around? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. See, it's a number ten. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic to see you, Nathan. Yes, sorry not to see you in person, but. Uh, that's what we, we have to be happy with what we just seeing your beautiful shirt, you. <laughs> and uh, so uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Nathan Katz from uh, University of Washington uh, that is going to talk about machine learning for physics discovery and control in optical systems. Number one. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much here. Uh, hi, everyone. I wish I could be there in person, of course. It'd be wonderful to be at Como itself. Uh, there's a, I haven't missed all the travel from COVID. You know, there's a lot of places we all go that we're not that excited about, but uh, Como is one where you kind of really hope to get there. Uh, so it's unfortunate it did not work out, but it'll be in the future again. So, um, so this is a, a two-part talk and and you know I wanted to uh, so thank you first of all to Aurelia for the nice talk because I'm going to build on a lot of these themes so you've seen an overview of neural networks and um, I want to start talking about using a lot of this for uh, thinking about physics systems and in particular we're going to move this towards thinking about control of optical systems so that's kind of the the way this is going to be structured so part one uh, today is going to just talk about what can we do with data in terms of the discovery of physics and engineering principles? Uh, how can we use the data to, to help us inform that? And then tomorrow, uh, we're going to start thinking about how we can then take that into the, the realm of, of controlling complex systems. All right, so uh, everything is going to focus here ultimately on targeted uses of neural networks. So what a way I think about this is that I'm gonna think about two concepts that we're gonna to have to really nail down. One is this idea of learning a coordinate system. And then the second is a way to represent the dynamics in that coordinate system. So I've drawn this specific chart here, right? Which is going from an input data through a coordinate transform to some dynamics. And the question is, how do you start learning these pairs? And I'm gonna talk about what it means to learn these pairs in the first place, but neural nets provide this really uh, exceptional way to learn um, representations in what's called a latent space uh, for that dynamics that we want to model a system with. So what do we typically do? Well, we've actually been doing this forever, learning coordinates and pairing it with dynamics. And the way we've normally done this is, you know, we think about special functions as being really nice representations of, of, of coordinate systems. So for instance, we in the 1900s, 20th century, we were playing a lot with special functions like Bessel, Hermit, Laguerre, and all these were, were special coordinate systems which allowed us a very efficient representation of solutions for different geometries specifically. Uh, and so we've made use of these nice coordinate systems for quite a long time in that. We can also use expert knowledge. So how do we use uh, all of our physics knowledge to build a good coordinate system? And so we've capitalized on that uh, for, for, for centuries. Um, and more recently, we start using uh, SVD-based methods. So in other words, a singular value decomposition takes data, looks at dominated correlated features. And in fact, this is such an important method that it comes under a lot of different names. So a lot of different uh, uh, areas of physics and mathematics and sciences have used something like the SVD. And it goes under names of what's called proper orthogonal decomposition, that's in fluid dynamics, PCA, which is more of a standard way to call it if you're from the statistics side, EOFs, empirical orthogonal functions, or a Hotling transform. It has like six or seven different names. So all these different fields have invented the same concept of taking data, transforming it into some 
uh, low rank representation. So some low dimensional subspace where the dynamics, uh, where you can do something with the dynamics there. And more recently, you can do nonlinear embeddings to shrink this down in some good appropriate coordinate system using neural networks. And Aurelia just talked quite a bit about different architectures for that. And we'll do that here too. Now, once you're in this coordinate system, what can you do? Well, a lot of times you have now is just time series data and you wanna do predictions on time series data. And there's standard statistical methods like ARIMA, which is autoregressive moving averages. That's one possibility of what you can do with modeling there. Another possibility is to use things like what are called dynamic mode decomposition or Koopman operators. And then the idea here is to write this in a coordinate system where the dynamics is linear here. And we're gonna talk more about that as we go along. Or what we often do is try to write down some governing equations in this coordinate system. And we're gonna learn how to do this from data using this, what's called the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. It's called SINDI. Um, where we can discover appropriate ODEs, PDEs in this coordinate system. For those of you who are aficionados of nonlinear dynamics, we can also try to represent this in terms of normal forms, or in this time variable, you can just do simple um, LSTM, grooves, echo state networks, and in fact, uh, Aurelio already talked about some of these, how you can just model the time dynamics with a, a neural network time stepper. So in either choice you have, there's lots of options about building coordinates and then building the time dynamics. And I'm gonna talk a lot about things that we might do more in the physics and engineering side of things. So let's start off with this concept of what I mean by a good coordinate system. That's, that's maybe the first thing I want to establish uh, is what does that mean? Well, I started off the talk with this as the background slide. And what you're looking at is the night sky, and you're seeing the retrograde motion here of the planet Mars. There it is. And over here is the retrograde motion of Saturn. And one of the uh, most famous and classical of all physics problems was celestial mechanics. And uh, it from the time of the ancients all the way up to you know our, our, our modern understanding of gravitation, people really wanted to understand the motion of planets and how could you predict their time courses. And so um, what you're looking at here is this, you know, what people had data, this was their data and the collecting this data uh, from the time of the ancients all the way to, you know, uh, Kepler and, and Tycho Brock and others until the modern day, they wanted to understand this dynamics. And so one of the things that, one of the first theories to really explain this was the doctrine of the perfect circle. So here's this uh, uh, great uh, Renaissance painting of trying to, to depict the doctrine of the perfect circle. This was a, a theory that came out of Alexandria, Egypt by Claudius Ptolemy in the second century AD. By this time, Alexandria and Egypt are now under the domain of the Roman Empire. Uh, you had an intellectual hub of activity there in Alexandria with the famous library. Um, and out of this comes this theory, these, the Claudius Ptolemy proposes this theory that essentially to understand the orbits of the planets, you could imagine them being circles on circles. So the way that I understand this retrograde motion is there's a giant circle with other circles moving around it. Um, so the, e the easiest way to understand that is that this was the earliest version of a Fourier transform. That's the way I like to think about that. So, and this theory lasted for about 1500 years. So there's very few theories in the existence of humankind that will last this long, but this one was a quite a long-standing theory. It might be like the Roman empire of theories, right? La lasting over a, mil a millennia. Okay. And then eventually, though, it was brought down. Uh, eventually, we changed and we moved away from this doctrine of the perfect circle. Um, and this happened through the efforts of various scientists, starting from Copernicus, where he really pushed for this idea of a heliocentric world, to uh, Galileo and Kepler laying the foundations, both observational and theoretical, for making this coordinate transformation. And so this 
it was sort of this undeniable amount of effort uh, to show that, in fact, we were in a situation where it was a heliocentric uh, world. There are great consequences to this, and you can read about that, both to Galileo, uh, whose trial was there in Rome, uh, and he recanted all of it. Uh, well, he was forced to, but, um, but of course, the idea stood. And it was because of this idea that Newton was able to take this heliocentric coordinate system and build an F equals MA theoretical construct for gravitation. So this is what I, what I think about of having a good coordinate system paired with dynamics. Newton cannot write down his F equals MA until you have the heliocentric coordinate system established. Okay, so that's, that's kind of my little conception of that. Um, and of course, Newton wasn't quite right. You know, in, by better observational data, we found inconsistencies between this gravitational law that Newton had proposed and what was actually observed, for instance, in some of the planets. And uh, at first they thought, well, maybe we were, we, there's a planet that's out there that we haven't observed yet. But in fact, it wasn't that. It was that uh, Einstein uh, developed his theory of general relativity, which showed that in fact, gravity was more complex than just your F equals MA law, that in fact, gravity warped local space time. And this is now improving our understanding of physical forces. There's no doubt that eventually as we get better and better measurements, there would be a picture to the right of Einstein of someone who has better data and can improve the general relativity model. But we might be a little ways out from, from getting that data right now. So. so that's what I mean by good coordinates is you pair this with governing equations uh, and, in, in, and you have a nice representation of, of physics. Um, there's something more to be said here though about Kepler and Newton. Uh, Kepler had in fact, his planetary laws laid out the elliptic orbits. In some sense, he had the solutions, which once you write down F equals MA and you derive the solutions to those equations, solve those equations, you get the same solution as Kepler. So what is the difference between, in some sense, Kepler and Newton? This represents, in my view, a very important philosophical difference because in some sense, Kepler, I think of him as the machine learning person, because what he did, he took the data, Tycho Brock's data, and he basically did a regression to these ellipses and in fact showed that, and was able to develop his, his laws with that data. Newton, on the other hand, with F equals MA, he could do something very important that we all typically wanna do in the sciences. He could extrapolate. What do I mean by extrapolate? Well, I can now envision a scenario where you launch a rocket from Earth, put it in orbit around the moon and bring it back. So this is something where you've never seen data. And yet this F equals MA law allows you to extrapolate this orbit and actually get it correctly because that's what we did in the late 1960s. So Kepler interpolated and Newton in some sense had a format which allowed for extrapolation and allowed us to build new physics beyond where we actually had measurements in the data. And that's actually a, a critical part of the scientific discovery process. So by the way, where does this play out today? I, hopefully you guys can see these videos, uh, but on the top, you see a robot. This is uh, from Boston Dynamics. This is an amazing, uh, <laughs> You, you can see how amazing robot technology is now. Look at this thing. It's doing a gymnastics routine, and it is much more athletic than I am, and uh, it has some really some amazing skill. And on the bottom is another version of autonomy, which is the self-driving car. The self-driving car can drive through traffic, can go through construction sites. It's uh, aware of its surroundings, and these are two machine learning paradigms that I think represent or reflect the legacy of Newton and the legacy of Kepler. In particular, um, on the top, that robot, current, the best robot technology today is physics-based technologies. In other words, that robot have, has 
all of its F equals MA physics in place in order to stabilize itself and to interact with the environment. Whereas the self-driving car has a bank of sensors. It has no physics. It just trained models on massive amounts of data from the sensors. And then you, imply, you impose rules about how fast you should accelerate, what kind of objects you should avoid. But these are two very successful strategies in machine learning, and they're exceptionally different. One builds in physics, the other does not. So I want to spend most of my time talking about the top one. I want to think about uh, what, what we want to do, which is extrapol extrapolation is actually what we're after. We want to get physics models. We want to be able to extrapolate. And that's, that's what that we're going to aim for today. Although the bottom one is clearly very successful uh, machine learning strategies as well. All right. So let's talk about the mathematical formulation of all of this. How do you start to set this up in some kind of principled way? Um, and what are the mathematics of it? So here's the introduction of the mathematical framework. What I want to do is collect data from a system. So I have a set of sensors and I collect measurements. Let's call them Y of T of K. So T of K means I collect data at specific time points and I'm measuring some system X. It's not even clear that I know what the right state variable is, what X is. I have measurements Y that are related through X through some measurement model H. This can be a nonlinear function. I also, every time I take a measurement, I bring in noise to that measurement, okay? And then the dynamics itself is subscribe, uh, prescribed by some dx dt equals f with some parameter dependence. So here's the objective. Given measurements y, reconstruct the dynamics f and discover measurement model h parameters theta. So I'm trying to do that just from measurements. I'm trying to learn the dynamics and learn my mapping from my measurements to the dynamics and the parameter dependence of the dynamics. So this is an ill-posed problem. In other words, I don't have enough information to uniquely solve this and uh, to determine that F, to determine the H. Um, and so normally when we say ill-posed problem, we say, well, we can't solve it. So we should go try to solve something maybe that's simpler because obviously this doesn't have a solution. But in fact, in sort of this machine learning world, when you have this idea of an ill-posed problem, the way you uh, make it well-posed is that you impose constraints or what's called regularizations or re regularizers onto this uh, problem. And so the question we want to ask is, to make this well posed, what are the kind of constraints we have to impose? Well, the ones I'm going to impose are around things that we have been doing for a long time in physics. In other words, we want to impose structure around the interpretability of the model and parsimony of the model. So these ideas are very old. They go back all the way to William of Ockham in the 1200s, where he tried to formalize this a little bit in terms of nominal models. In other words, if you can explain most of your model with a small number of terms, just use those terms, okay? And um, this, was, this, this idea has uh, lived in various forms for a long time. And in fact, here's our Italian, Buffredo Pareto. Pareto was, uh, very much into economic theory. And he has now this idea of what's called the Pareto front, which is, you know, you, you use as many variables as you need to get a good performance, but no more, right? So you use just the ones that are maximally informative about getting you uh, a good model for the data you're working with. So both of these concepts that, the, that have, we've seen over time are really, I think, at the heart of ultimate physics regularization, which is if you believe in dominant balance physics, in other words, when you measure a system, there's, there's what you're seeing is the manifestation of dominant balance physics, then you should you then normally you can only need a, a couple, two to three terms that dominate uh, the physics. OK, 
Okay, so that's what we're going after here with this idea of interpretability and parsimony is we want to build models that are maximally informative, but that are also parsimonious. Okay, so that is going to frame how we regularize and we make this problem well posed is we're going to impose constraints here. Okay, so there's a bunch of different ways to maybe do this. So let's start off by uh, talking about the diversity of methods we can bring towards this problem. The first thing I want to do is think about what if I were to learn a coordinate transformation and where I force a model to be linear, okay? So uh, norm many of us here, uh, think about nonlinear dynamics. And so this is gonna be an interesting concept, which is this idea of what's called Koopman theory. And the idea is to move to a coordinate system that linearizes the dynamic. It's not a linearization around a fixed point. It is a new variable in which the dynamics becomes linear. So here's the idea. If you look on the top left, this is a second order ODE. Notice it's got, uh, x1 dot, x2 dot, there's the nonlinearity there, it depends on x1 squared. And of course, this is nonlinear, so normally what we would do with ODE of this form, we might find fixed points and do stability around those fixed points to get the global dynamics. You can, however, trade out to this set of variables, y1, y2, y3, and notice that within this set of variables, where I've introduced y3, which is x1 squared, Notice that the dynamics now is linear. This is a fantastic change of variables. I went from a nonlinear set of ODEs by just making a transformation of variables to a linear uh, ODEs. And then I can just do anything I want in this variable. I can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix here. And I can tell you everything that happens in the dynamics. So this is exactly ide the idea of what's called Koopman theory, which is to find an embedding of your nonlinear dynamics into a space where the dynamics is linear. So one way to actually approximate this using numerical methods is what's called the dynamic mode decomposition. And all this is, is a regression to the best fit linear model, okay? So the idea is that you take some complex system and you take measurements of that system so here they are in time points, this thing is evolving according to some nonlinear dynamics. I don't necessarily know what those dynamics are, but I can collect measurements of the system. So I collect measurements of the systems and I arrange two data matrices, X and X prime. And the difference between X and X prime is X prime are all the measurements X advance delta T into the future and to, to form X prime. Now with those two data matrices, I'm actually then just gonna look for a matrix A that when I multiply A times X, I get to X prime. In other words, the matrix A is essentially approximation to the uh, linear dynamics advancing the solution delta T. And one way to do that is just simply by least square regression. So you just simply say, well, if there's a matrix A that takes a acting on X to get to X prime, then I can just take the pseudo inverse of, uh, of X. And then I have here the best fit, least from a least square sense, linear model. So this is what I've done is I've approximated the dynamics by some linear dynamical system. That's what dynamic mode decomposition does. And in fact, this was recognized in about 2009 by Rowley, Mesich and others that if you do this regression now, you can take this nonlinear dynamics and fit the best fit linear model. And more recently, people have said, well, let's build on this Koopman idea, which is I don't have to do this regression directly on X. I can maybe propose some G of X. In other words, some set of nonlinear observables. And then I can construct out of this G of X, Y and Y prime, and then do a regression then on this new coordinates y and y prime to build a linear model. So the idea is to find, let's say, some appropriate observable set y's so that I can actually linearize the dynamics in a better way. So 
how do I get that G of X? Well, that's a, that's a complicated business. And so one of the best ways to do it is actually, I think, is through learning neural nets. So just, just to remind you, neural nets, uh, this is the first line, and I like to quote it here from Stefan Malat's paper on understanding deep convolutional neural nets. Supervised learning is a high dimensional interpolation problem. So that it's the word interpolation is absolutely critical here because that's where we're, uh, you just have to understand some of the limitations of a neural net. But there's a lot of great things you can still do with these neural nets, obviously, because that's why we're talking about these deep learning. So here's what we're going to do. And this is work with Bethany Lush. Um, we're going to learn, do neural nets for our Koopman embedding. So in other words, we're going to start off from my measurement space, X. We're going to have an encoder here. So some nonlinear transformation to a new variable, Y of K. This is the latent representation. And I can come back through the decoder. So I have an encoder, a decoder. And I really want this to be an autoencoder structure. In other words, I want this new variable to be at the intrinsic dimension of the dynamics. So what we're going to talk about first is, for instance, a nonlinear, the full nonlinear pendulum. And the nonlinear pendulum can be parameterized by, you know, theta, theta, dot. So this should be two-dimensional in this variable. So this should be two-dimensional here. And the question is, can I learn a transformation from my initial measurement space to a new variable representation where the pendulum, that nonlinear pendulum, becomes linear? So the way I want to do this is, I want to learn this transformation. And in this new coordinate system, when I go from y of k to y of k plus 1, in other words, time point y of k to time point y of k plus 1, I take the delta t step, I want that to be a linear map. If I take two steps into the future, it's that linear map squared. OK? So let's try to do this. Let's try to learn this coordinate embedding. and we failed. So in fact, I'm going to, this is interesting, right? Because uh, I, I say obviously at the bottom, because it took us a long time to figure out why, why this wouldn't work. But it's so obvious after the fact, of course, like anything else, you know, you, you do something and then you just realize like, wait a minute, I should have known this for a long time. And so why did we fail? I'll tell you exactly why we failed. And in fact, here are my graduate uh, school notes on asymptotics and perturbations. And here's what I, here's what I want to show you. What happens with nonlinearity? So let's take an even simpler version, which is nonlinear oscillator, where I introduce a little bit of the cubic correction, which would come from a Taylor series expansion of the nonlinear pendulum. So what does this cubic nonlinearity do? Two things. It shifts the frequency of the oscillation. In other words, as the oscillations get bigger, the period gets longer. And it also generates harmonics. In fact, if you do a perturbation expansion of this, you can see it right down here. Here's a solution. You can see a frequency shift here. And then you can also see harmonics there. So you can just run this, uh, uh, this duffing oscillator in MATLAB, for instance. And you'll look at the spectrogram. In other words, here's the frequency content as a function in the y-axis of the amplitude or as a function of epsilon. And notice, here's your main frequency and see how it's shifting as the amplitude gets bigger. Here's your third harmonic. Here's your fifth harmonic. So in other words, if I want to represent the dynamics of the system, notice I have to span all these frequencies. And I was trying to pinch this down to two dimensions. And this is telling me I can't do that, not the way at least I built the system. What you have to do is actually learn a side network which parametrizes that linear operator by its frequency. So in other words, this will be a linear operator, but it has a parametric dependency on the frequency. So essentially what you're handling is the continuous spectrum that you know exists in the pendulum. So this so you can still use this neural network architecture. Now, now notice how we have coupled neural networks working together to produce this model. 
And it does, it does a nice job here. In fact, let's take the pendulum. If this is the full nonlinear pendulum, theta double dot is equal to sine theta. And here's what the phase plane looks like. Here are the oscillations. And notice that you get quite a shift in, frequent, uh, in sort of the structure. It doesn't look like sinusoidal anymore. It's now starting to get to be, but still periodic, but the period shifts. And this is what the phase plane looks like. And if you learn this representation, you can turn it all into linear dynamics, which is shown here on the bottom. So now you have in this new coordinate system, fully nonlinear dynamics, and the coordinate transformation that got you there, here in some sense are your eigen, nonlinear eigenfunctions to move you into that coordinate system. So this is a way to take this fully nonlinear pendulum and embed it in a linear, uh, in a linear model. We can do this for more complicated dynamics. Here is flow around the cylinder. So flow around the cylinder, you get von Karman vortex shedding on the back end of the cylinder, which is represented here by these plots. And, but it's still sort of nice periodic behavior. So we can look at the dynamics of this and look at some low dimensional representation of this by doing the singular value decomposition. And you find that it's something like a, there's a, there's a nice nonlinear dynamical system that represents the motion of this fluid dynamics. But we can take that full nonlinear dynamics and we can embed it in a linear coordinate system. So now we've linear made, made this nonlinear dynamics linear in an appropriate coordinate system. So this is very encouraging that you can actually find these Koopman representation of dynamics. Uh, in other words, embed your dynamics in a linear model um, and you can learn these with a neural network transformation. We built further on this theme, and this one I think is kind of remarkable. So those of you who are familiar with the kuramoto shibasinski model, so this is a very, you know, produces a lot of complex dynamics. This is work with Craig Jin, who was a postdoc here. So the kuramoto shibasinski model produces a lot of spatial temporal chaos. And what we did is say, well, there's probably no way we'd be able to embed that in a linear model. But in fact, what we did is we did exactly that. We took the space, we built a much more complicated neural network architecture here, where we also brought the identity down. And that's really important because uh, essentially a lot of the dynamics are near identity transformations. So we explicitly built it into there. And we move into a new coordinate system where we try to build a linear map. And so what you're seeing here on the right is in fact, uh, five different trajectories looking at the solution itself. So this is the exact solution. In other words, numerical simulation of kuramoto shibasinski And this is our network approximation to it with a linear model. So that's in this new V coordinates. I can move the dynamics into V, take a bunch of steps forward in time, and then bring it back out through the decoder. And you can see basically, we can train a linear model for the kerr motor equation. So for those of you who come from an optics background uh, and especially nonlinear Schrodinger dynamics, you know that in fact, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation allows you to make a transformation to a new variable set through the Marchenko, uh, so through inverse scattering transform, which allows you to linearize KDV nonlinear Schrodinger because they're completely integrable. And what we've done here is done something very similar, but for a non-integrable equation, which is the kuramoto shibashinsky equation. So we were quite happy with this to, to be able to do something like this. But it also shows you how powerful these neural networks are to be able to do something like this. Okay, so what I've been talking about mostly is warping space, in other words, I have a coordinate system I want to learn. So spatial coordinate system, if I can ch change the coordinate representation so that the dynamics becomes linear. You can do something similar by warping time itself. So what we started to look at, and this is with Henning Langa, is to say, well, these linear model ideas are nice, but really if I have some complicated time dynamics, right? So some, you know, a lot of our dynamics that we look at are quasi-periodic, periodic, quasi-periodic, quasi but highly nonlinear, can I in fact learn a way to do good forecasting with this? So a really fantastic forecasting tool is Fourier forecasting. So you project everything 
into the Fourier domain. Now, why Fourier modes are nice for long-term forecasting is that Fourier modes or for, you know, Fourier series, when you go to infinity, they don't blow up, nor do they go to zero. There's very few functions that survive to infinity and everything, be, all the cosines and sines stay between one and minus one. So they're kind of ideal for long-term forecasting. The problem is that if you have complex, more comp complicated um, Fourier mode expansions, you have to keep around a lot of Fourier modes, a lot of broadband Fourier modes to describe the evolution far into the future. What we do instead, so that's what this is. This is just a Fourier expansion. What we can do instead is we learn a neural network transformation, which can take time series like what you see here and try to warp that time series to make it look sinusoidal. So if you can make warp this to make it look sinusoidal, now you can make use of this Fourier expansion in a very uh, advantageous way. So we've done this and in fact, What's amazing about this, we took some power grid data and we said, let's forecast uh, sort of medium to long-term forecasts with power grid data. And I'm just wanna show you here a comparison of this Koopman forecasting method against the leading neural network architectures, which are LSTM, GRU Echo State Networks. Uh, LSTMs uh, uh, were talked about by Aurelio in the last talk. So here they are. Uh, and as well as standard statistical methods like ARIMA models uh, and auto ARIMA, so forth. And what you're seeing here is a chart of performance. And the thing I want to highlight is this Koopman forecast beats all of them, partly because we're, we're in this hybrid mode of using deep neural nets with physics-informed pieces of information. In other words, Fourier. So I always think that that's our best strategy as physicists is to think about physics and form machine learning where we bring in all this knowledge of physics and forecasting in this case, and then use neural nets in the right way or in targeted ways to improve things. So, I, and also it shows you that even if you just train a black box LSTM, which is the typical that you can use for time series data, you can do quite a bit better than, than those which are considered the state of the art for machine learning. So where does this come to play? Well, for instance, you can do things like improve reduced order models. So what you're looking at here is a PDE simulation of flow in a cavity. And so what you're looking at is uh, essentially what we did is we took snapshots of this, looked at its low dimensional representation and said, how can I predict the future of this thing? So what reduced order models typically do is they will take the dynamics and do a Galerican projection into this low rank subspace. What we do instead is just look at the time series and forecast it with this Koopman uh, forecasting trick. And in fact, it's amazing. So we're not even solving a PDE anymore. We're simply forecasting the future state in some small number of variables, right? Some small parsimonious set of variables way out into the future. And this is just a comparison of that future. And you can see that this really does an exceptional job uh, doing this simulation or this forecast for this system. Okay, so I wanna move on because we've spent all this time talking about linear models. What about nonlinear models? Many of us really enjoy nonlinearity and like working with nonlinearity. And so let's try to figure out instead of constraining the dynamics to linear models, maybe we can just let it be, uh, allow ourselves some flexibility of parsimonious, however, nonlinear models. And so this is where this idea of sparse identification and nonlinear dynamics comes from. This is Cindy. This is discovery of governing equations. The idea here, and by the way, all of this is just simply AX equal to B. I want to emphasize that. There's, that that's all this is, is AX equal to B. It's an overdetermined AX equal to B system where we're gonna promote sparse solutions, okay? Uh, so here's the dynamics, and I'm not gonna tell you it came from Lorenz, for instance. You're gonna give me a time series of X, Y, and Z, and you're gonna ask, can you tell me what governing equations produce this time series? But if you, I'm trying to find then the X dot equals F of X that did this. So if you give me the X, I can compute X dot. So that's the B, in AX equal to B. The matrix A in that AX equal to B 
is a set of candidate library functions of the dynamics. So f of x could be made up of, well, make a, make a bunch of choices there, make a list of library elements. So you can pick up your physics books off your shelf and make up candidate functions. Well, it could depend upon polynomials or quadratics or derivative terms. Here, we're not doing PDEs, so we wouldn't put that in. But here we just do up to fifth order polynomials. So x dot equals up to fifth order polynomials, but this is very much up to your imagination. And so x equal to b. And what you do, instead of doing your standard regression, which is a least square fit typically for this, which will tell you that every single library element matters, now what you do is you promote sparsity. And by promoting sparsity, you're trying to pick out how few library elements can I use to fit this model? And promoting sparsity is typically promoting the zero norm of this or the proxy L1 norm of this regression. And we can do this in a number of ways. And we've developed our own method for doing this, which is quite robust and stable called, which is sequential least square thresholding. And so you're trying to zero out as many terms as possible. And these are the non-zero elements that are left and they just give you back the governing equation. So from the data itself, this inverse problem allows you to build your governing differential equations. So we applied this to PDEs, for instance, spatial temporal systems. So this is work with Sam Rudy. And here I just give a table. Here's all these different PDEs. And all you had was the data. So I just give you spatial temporal data. And from that, you discover the governing PDE, okay? So the biggest challenge of this method is that you have to compute really good derivatives for the X dot equals F of X. Because remember, you're just really regressing to fitting those derivatives. And if you don't get good derivative estimates, it's very difficult to discover the governing equations. Another way to say that is, um, you can't tolerate too much noise in this discovery process, although we have been working very hard to circumvent this issue. And in fact, here's one of the ways we've done this. This is work with Seth Hirsch. Uh, we took the same formalism, but instead of doing the sparse regression, we instead do a Bayesian formulation of this where your basic uh, setup for this is to say, I'm going to do a regression for this where I'm going to make some as assumption, uh, sparsely promoting assumptions on this, which is I'm going to assume that these have some distributions which are called the slab, uh, spike and slab models for these. And the spike and slab models allow me to actually start to get a probability distribution for each one of these coefficients of the library. And so, for instance, here's what you get. Just like in a good Bayesian framework, you don't get a, a one answer. You get your answer is in the form of a probability distribution. And so there it is here. So now you have these probability distributions. And notice most of them are mean zero with some variance, small variance around zero, which means those guys are probably not part of the model. In fact, these ones here, which have means that are far from zero and have some variance, those are the right models in some sense for this case. The great thing about this method is I can handle a lot of noise and I can have very little time course data, which are both issues that the normal Cindy method struggles with. So this is one way around, um, ha you know, systems where you, you have a lot of noise and you don't have that much data. And, that, and the data issue is a big issue, right, for, for, for a lot of this, because, you know, if you're building any kind of deep neural nets anywhere, uh, you're gonna have to have a lot of data. All right, so here is though a, a very important consideration. I know many of you on this call, in fact, uh, Claudio, Stefan, I've known them since, since I was a baby boy uh, many years ago. And uh, what I know is that many of you have deep training in physics. So you know a lot of physics. It's not like you come to a problem and you take data and you have no idea what you're doing and I just wanna try most of the time you have a very good intuition about the physics. However, your model may not be accurate enough. So this gets us into this very practical consideration of what I call discrepancy modeling. 
And in discrepancy modeling, instead of starting from scratch and acting as if you know nothing, you have some partial knowledge of the physics. You may know some conservation laws, or you may know something about, uh, you know, there, you know, that you know something about some idealized version of the Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. Okay, so in other words, you know that some of this, this is true. This x, of x. The problem is that f of x doesn't capture all the physics. I'm missing some physics. So really, what I need to do is learn this missing physics, that's this discrepancy. So notice that if I already know what f of x is, I can go right back to the Cindy architecture. I can take this f of x, move it to the left-hand side. So instead of when I solve that ax equal to b, the b was just the derivatives before, but now the b is the derivatives minus my known f of x. And then I regress on a library of terms to try to determine the g of x. Now, where does this become important? I'm going to give you some ex examples here. So what you're seeing here is a pendulum on a cart. Hopefully this is working. All right. So on the top, that pendulum on a cart, it's a double pendulum on a cart, had the platonic model of the physics. In other words, it knew the masses, the lengths, and it, try and it said, go try to stabilize this given the ideal physics model. And because of the frictional forces, both in the joints and in the wind resistance, this thing is not very, it's very hard to do that. So it, it can't stabilize that pendulum. However, if it can learn a model for the discrepancy, in other words, between the idealized models and the actual physics of this system, it can stabilize this in the upright position. Where this is gonna be especially important is here, in I think the modern digital twin framework. So here what you're seeing is a robot arm on the left and on the right. So on the right, of course, the real system on the left is your virtual representation of it, right? So this is your platonic model of the robot arm. The problem is when you do precision manufacturing, the model on the left is not accurate enough to really represent that robot arm. So what you need to do is put sensors on here and have this thing learn the difference between what is the idealized model and what is actually happening in the real experiment. And every single robot arm will have a slightly different discrepancy model. And what this allows you to do is it's a very general framework to discover that discrepancy model that you would have for this, for this robot arm or for any other physical system. So this is where I see that uh, the Cindy method can really be practical, practically implemented because you, you exploit all the physics you know, and then you target the learning on trying to find the physics you don't know. Okay, so in these cases, I told you what the dynamics was and I already, I, I, or we discovered the dynamics, but we didn't talk about the coordinates. We, I assumed we already knew the coordinate system. So here, what I wanna finish kind of along these lines is also just, just trying to understand how do I do dynamics and coordinates jointly? So this is work with Kathleen Champion. And I, I really like this one for, for a couple reasons. What you're seeing here is this idea of what I showed on the first slide, right? Which is taking your initial space, learning a coordinate transformation, and then making something happen here. We've talked about building uh, linear models here. And now we also talk about Cindy here. So this is what we wanna do now is say, if I measured something, could I learn a coordinate transformation in which the dynamics now satisfy Cindy, this sparse identification? And in fact, here's the loss function. Why is this modeling framework important? At least it's important to me for the following reason. If I were to film a pendulum, the coordinate system that is actually computed or captured in the data, if I film a pendulum, is pixel space. Now, we are very biased, so we immediately would say, oh, that's pixel space, but there's a theta theta dot. But if we didn't know that, what this allows us to do is take pixel space and over time, if I had enough data, 
it would learn to move it into a coordinate system to learn theta theta dot. And in that coordinate system, it learned theta double dot is sine theta. So it's very practical. The pendulum is a perfect example. You'd go from pixel space, it would learn theta theta dot and then learn the dynamics of that. And also this relates exactly to my motivating example, which is if you were an observer on earth of planetary motion, you'd have to learn a coordinate transformation where F equals MA holds. So what it would learn for you is the heliocentric coordinate system. And then in the heliocentric coordinate system, F equals MA. So that's the idea of this kind of architecture. Um, and by the way, everything I've talked about so far, all the codes up on GitHub, all the data is up there. So you, you can reproduce any of this, you know, all this is programmed. And uh, I think all my students are using TensorFlow. So you can just, you know, run any of these codes if you, if you like, or at least even see how to put in this kind of loss function. So by the way, here are some examples from that paper Kathleen wrote. And really, I just want to emphasize the bottom one here. This is taking pendulum data. So pixel space, learning a coordinate embedding, and then learning theta double dot is negative sine theta. So this is, uh, this is exactly the kind of paradigm we want for physics discovery modeling. A couple comments. One is that uh, the coordinate transformation itself is not generalizable. So if I took a pendulum and I filmed it and I put, filmed another pendulum, which was twice the length, um, the neural network coordinate system I learned for one pendulum would not work on the other. However, the theta double dot equals negative sine theta does work across, uh, across different uh, coordinate systems. So just a little side note. All right, some, some finishing up pieces of this. How, do you, how would you handle multi-scale physics? For many of us, we have, if we have simple physics, we might be able to figure it out without really a lot of help from neural networks, right? Uh, but for multi-scale physics, this is very difficult. And how could you use neural networks to help you here to discover coordinate systems? So this is work with Yu Ying Lu. And the idea here is, well, you could start using these convolutional autoencoders. This is something, again, Aurelia talked about convolutional neural networks, where you look at feature spaces of different sizes. So you first learn a coarse grain model, coarse grain representation of the, uh, of uh, spatially of the system. And that's this first architecture. And then you refine the model wherever uh, a lot of the feature space happens on a short scale. In other words, wherever the model fit is worse, you do refinement. So now you've refined more, uh, you refine further and further and further and use the previous layers of the network and you import those to the next layers to, tr to help that training process speed up. So this makes the training faster. Um, and it also has this transfer learning aspect to it. So you do transfer learning. And this is exactly what we do in multi-grid computational techniques. You do refinement where you need. And this is exactly the structure that Yu Ying has built here to handle multi-scale spatial physics. We can also do boundary value problems. And I want to, this is so, you know, everything I've been talking about is dynamics, but boundary value problems, you do the same thing. You have the same generic architecture. You learn a coordinate transformation and to a new variable set and then to back out. But now you learn a coordinate transformation to some boundary value problems. So you can discover boundary value problems from this. And really uh, one thing that we're super excited about is because of this nonlinear transformation to a linear coordinate, you can discover nonlinear Green's functions. So for many of us in optics who grew up with Jackson's E and M book, um, right? Green's functions were everywhere in that book in terms of representations of solutions. And of course, Green's functions don't work except for in linear problems. But what this is telling you is I can learn a coordinate transformation to make things linear. I now can build, in fact, the Green's function there and then come back out. And so this is uh, some, some more recent work that's just up on the archive. Um, so I'm gonna conclude there. So this is like part one. So what I've tried to do is give a broad brushstrokes of these different sort of neural network architectures that can be paired with our physics in sort of a uh, advantageous way so that we can sort of do model discovery 
and the, and, and and really address this ill posed problem by using parsimony as the ultimate physics regularization architecture. Uh, and then what we're going to do with this is uh, in lecture tomorrow is build on this towards understanding control architectures that now can be brought in onto this. So I'll stop there. And and for you guys are it's late for you. It's just it's finally getting light out here in Seattle. <laughs> so. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stefan. I don't see my own video. Maybe because uh, you should. Uh, you should. Uh, go like that. So let's see. So thanks. That that was really amazing. I liked it. I just, I'm, I'm sorry I cannot see you in person. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I wish I could be there, but uh, this this will have to do, right? So for I now. I have a lot of questions uh, to discuss with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two glasses. <laughs> Let me see uh, here, uh, first of all, uh, the, okay, the, can you see the questions? Yeah, let me pull them up here. Oh, okay, here we go, yeah. Uh, Stenio. Okay, does the model of the pendulum that uses the additional frequency term only work consider as some initial point? I'm thinking about what happens when it's moving uh, through the tractor at the beginning of the dynamics transients. Okay, does the linear map also work in this situation? So this is a great question. Uh, at least in the embedding we did, uh, what we had looked at was no dissipation, right? So when we started this oscillator, we started off with the simplest case of simply looking at um, it without oscillations. In that case, you give me, if you specify the initial amplitude and the initial velocity, it completely prescribes the mapping and the parameterization of the frequency. If you have damping, then what's going to happen is you're going to have to take into account, as you said, this transient dynamics as it dies down. And there are definitely ways to do that. It would be essentially in your linear term, you'd have some exponential decay that would be in there. So hopefully that uh, makes some sense. So first, Daniel. All right, Sergey. Hey, Sergey. Okay. Uh, is the choice of the basis, apart from polynomial set, an art or can be done systematically? So I, I'm assuming this is related to Cindy. Uh, so this is a great question. Um, so if you noticed, when I built these library terms for either differential equations or even for when I did partial differential equations, oftentimes, like let's say for partial differential equations, we used polynomials and then derivatives of the of the of the terms like hey if the if if the state variable is u i might put u of x in there u of xx in there ux squared everything is to be seems to be polynomials beyond polynomials it is a little bit of an art but what's interesting is when you look at dominant balance physics most of it is some kind of taylor series expansion around some dominant regime where in fact polynomials hold. So even though polynomials is, uh, you know, that's normally very easy to put in, you could do other things, but anything else is a little bit of an art for sure. Um, but people have been working at building uh, genetic algorithms essentially to build, to enrich the library so that you would could automate that process too of the art of picking library elements. Hi, Sergey, I got you. Thanks. In. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, whatever strange reason I was not able to show myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> But yeah, that's that. Hopefully, that answers that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I keep going to this idea that, you know, if you look at all our textbooks, right, they're all polynomial models, almost all of them, right? <laughs> Very, or if they're not, we tailor expand in some region and then and make it polynomial. So, and a, a lot of the arguments for that, again, are around this dominant balance physics idea. And so, my yeah, thought is that, that's the whole point because, yes, of course, polynomials can be used, but if your real uh, sort of uh, approximation is sinusoidal function, yeah. then you will have infinite number in terms of polynomials. So you, yeah, yeah. you would prefer to use sinu 
sinus and cosinus. So that, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, so we did an experiment actually. We took, we took actual, we, we built a pendulum and we, we actually, if you do the pendulum, it will, always, it will never pick the sign if you have oscillations. In fact, it can do amazing job all the way up to about here because it really, it can pick up that correction with just the cubic very easily. So when it picks up the sign is if you tend the trajectory where it goes over the top. When it goes over the top, it says, oh, a sign cannot do that. I mean, sorry, the, the cubic cannot do, you know, like, and so we built, it was a stiff pendulum. It was a rod so that you could go over the top. So you could flick this thing around, go around a couple of times and settle into oscillations. And in that case, it traded out any of the polynomials for saying only a sign can do this. And so it replaces any kind of Taylor series expansion by that sign. So that's kind of in some sense to get it, you'd have to have a diversity of initial data to rule out, say, well, uh, a polynomial approximation works in this regime. Yeah, but does it work here, here, and here, and here for this diversity of initial data that I had? And that's when it starts to say, well, if you're gonna work everywhere, I've got to, I've got to turn that into a sign because it has to work everywhere. But if you only give me this regime, I could probably make it work with a cubic, let's say. Uh, Nathan, I have a question uh, for you that uh, is uh, just my curiosity and my interest in, uh, from the point of view of nonlinear optics. So just to stimulate, I would say that we have a, a more Newtonian approach of uh, using simple models uh, like F equal, equal uh, MA or a nonlinear Schrodinger, pure uh, nonlinear Schrodinger model to predict uh, our experiments and uh, of course, we neglect the noise and neglect the higher order terms. So that's why we fail in many cases. And a typical example is when we observe uh, unstable systems like a uh, generation of rock waves yeah. in the sea or in fibers. Uh, and uh, the general feeling, uh, like somebody like Nai, like Media will tell you, you, know, you cannot predict. Uh, there is no predictability. But uh, if you have been observing uh, long enough in the past, uh, could you? actually predict a rock wave? Uh, could you extend the, the, the range of your predictability of what will happen in the future in a realistic uh, system, a linear system? Yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a great question. One of the things that we've been trying to understand is in those systems, if you have, yeah, right, like perfect measurements, I think you could do something. And then the real question is, if I have a little bit of noise, so a lot of these things, right, they seed it with a little bit of noise. The question is, even a little bit of noise, is that noise larger than the signal I'm looking for, which would tell me when this thing is going to come, right? So a lot of times, right, like if you go far enough from the event, from let's say some extreme event, it decays exponentially away from there. So it's very easy all of a sudden, far away from it, that that the signal is there, but it's exponentially small. So even a little bit of noise hides it from you. So one of the things that we had considered was, when can you actually discover physics? And when is it hidden from you because of noise? So what I think is kind of remarkable, if you look back at what Newton was doing, was Newton convinced by Galileo. So Galileo says gravity is constant. But if you actually go, and we did this experiment, we took some balls and we dropped them from a sixth floor garage. And none of those balls hit the same time, right? So how did Galileo come up? Was that? <laughs> yeah. So how did Galileo, it's, it's an amazing leap, by the way, from Galileo, right? This, this leap to say that gravity is this a constant thing is the data doesn't seem to back it. The only way I can think that he came up with this is by rolling them down inclines, right? Where you could take away the air resistance. Maybe then he can come up with this assertion that gravity is constant. But look what Newton is doing. As soon as St. Paul's Cathedral is built, he goes to the top of it and starts dropping balls, right? Because he's still not convinced. 
And he's trying to figure out why is it when you do that, do they hit at different times? And part of it, is, and then he does these experiments where he now starts moving a pendulum through mercury, right? So he, back then you could just take mercury, put it in a, <laughs> in a bath and, and he put your pendulum in it because what he wanted to do was to understand what was the discrepancy that did not allow that actually could you could still say gravity was constant but then you could just tell me tell me why does the bowling ball hit differently than a coconut and it turns out that he was doing these experiments to understand flow fields around these balls right he was trying to say what's the drag because he had to explain that and it wasn't until he did these very careful experiments that he could actually posit a reason, reasonable model. In other words, up until that point, that was below the noise floor. And then once you get it to a certain point, then you can start seeing that, in fact, there is in this drag field that's proportional sort of to the, you know, the velocity, right? That's our velocity squared. That's what we normally have. So these are kind of interesting concepts is, is there's noise. And if you can see below the noise, then you can start building models, just like also Einstein did with these improved measurements of planetary motion, if it wasn't for the improved measurements, we don't have general relativity. But because of those improved measurements, he could finally see beyond the noise to see there's actually something here that's deterministic in nature. That's my concern with these rogue waves is in real systems, that effect is below the noise somehow. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there is some question in the q and a i think from juan all right so juan okay would juan. Coop, yeah uh would koopman still work if one has only to access to a nonlinear measurement of the system instead of the state itself um so field intensity instead of uh instead of the actual field itself um, I would say yes. In fact, uh, we, we played around with this. We, were, we looked a little bit at this where you can actually take uh, intensity measurements, and obviously you don't have the phase information of the electric field, but you can enrich the measurement space to build a Koopman approximation that's quite accurate. Yes, I think you can do that. And the other thing that people do commonly now for Koopman is they'll time delay embed the dynamic. So you'll take the measurement, you'll time delay embed it, and it creates a much richer representation of the dynamics. Okay, I don't see more questions and we are already 10 minutes past the, the yeah. hour let's say it ideally we should go for dinner now yes continue with fun. <laughs> that'd be <Yeah>. fantastic <laughs> some aperitivo. oh another question from yeah. stefan stefan uh, yes yeah, stefan barlang oh there's one more here Forecasting, I, so he says, he comment on the forecasting of rogue waves. Uh, you train in a network to do forecasting and look at its performance. As long as it's predictive correctly, everything is fine. If prediction and facts start to diverge, that would mean a rogue event is coming by definition. Yeah, that could be a possibility, right? So you, you can start to look at essentially discrepancies between forecast and actual physics, right? So this is like a, a data simulation framework. Whereas you start to see divergence, you could mark that time potentially, right? And say something interesting is happening here. I guess the real question is, at what point would you get that discrepancy, right? Is it right before the rogue wave hits? Is it, there's probably some delta T. That would be actually interesting to consider. How, what's the delta T where your model and, 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 and data start to diverge that you could actually predict a rogue event? That'd be a good one to look at. Yeah, all this uh, forecasting, of course, goes well beyond the uh, optics. Uh, no. Could apply to football and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> games, uh, stock market. 
Maybe Totti would even been better. So, <laughs> yeah, I think John Dudley mentioned that this. Sorry, so, sorry, Nathan. Famous uh, Brazil Germany is a typical rock wave, an extreme event. <laughs> that was the worst yeah, rogue wave. Repeated. We cannot learn from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the worst rogue wave ever. <laughs> yes. It's actually some comments on it. <laughs> No, I think there is a one uh, by Lorenzo, but it's uh, not. Uh, okay. Sometimes shift. It was uh, from. This yeah, probably we should call it a day and have some rest. Great, Great. talk. Thank you, guys, and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. everybody. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.